Thank you, Ted. That's uh, very kind words and breakneck speed. Yes, uh, definitely a reflection of all the hard work of the team that we've assembled in the de Blasio administration and obviously the mayor's absolute commitment to assuring that all New Yorkers have affordable housing. One little thing you forgot to mention in my bio, which um, for many people in the room, or it's sort of amazing how many people are in this room um, in general, but my last gig in government, which uh, was about 12 and a half years ago, I actually had the honor of running the supportive housing programs at HPD, and it's been an incredible, incredible journey for all the wonderful people at HPD, and so for me, this is an incredible homecoming to be part of this today and in my new role to welcome you to this amazing day. Um, actually, one month ago today, we announced um, the housing plan, which, as you know, the fundamental goal is to build or preserve 200,000 affordable housing units. And that is really an extraordinarily ambitious goal because it's really about people. Um, and those 200,000 units are about, we think, will house about 500,000 New Yorkers. That, by the way, is larger than the population of Atlanta. So this is no small task and one that we look forward to working with everybody in the community to achieve. And we understand how important this is going to be for this community, but also for the city as a whole. It's also an extraordinary economic development engine. Um, we estimate that this will cost about $41 billion um, to get this plan off the ground. And that's going to require a huge amount of public-private partnership and getting stakeholders from across the industry to really row in the same direction. As you may have seen, the mayor actually then put his money where his mouth is, and we doubled the amount of capital in HPD's budget for the next five years. So we're not just talking the talk, we are walking the walk, and we have an amazing team of people at the city who are going to help implement this plan. I do want to just acknowledge a few folks today from uh, my colleagues um, in city government as well as some of the fantastic partners at the state. Um, we have the fabulous Vicki Bean here, our commissioner of HPD, Jessica Katz, who has a version of my old gig and has taken it to a whole nother level. The amazing Kristen Meisner, who works with Deputy Mayor Lillian Barrios Paoli, who is my great colleague. And of course, the wonderful uh, Deputy Secretary for Health, Courtney Burke, Deputy Secretary for Human Services, Louisa Chafee, and my former colleague in city government and fantastic great woman in government, Fran Ryder. So you really have the A-team here today to really pull this together and help today make um, as much progress as we can in this incredible challenge that we face. Um, look, you guys know the statistics better than I do, um, but rents are rising, um, incomes are dropping, the affordability gap is getting worse for everybody. The numbers now are sort of extraordinary. Over 50% of New Yorkers pay more than 30% of their gross income a year in rent. And those numbers are getting increasingly um, out of whack. And that means we have an affordability crisis, not just for very, very low income New Yorkers, but for all New Yorkers. And that fundamentally challenges the ability for New York City to continue to be the great and diverse city it is. So this is a massive challenge that really um, surpasses just the traditional issues around what are we doing to house the very poor, which obviously is the focus of today. But I do want you to understand how incredibly important this is holistically to New York York City's economy and ultimately to our position as a global city. Now, clearly, we need the city to be, continue to be the leader in innovation, and supportive housing has really been, uh, this has really been the birthplace in many respects to the supportive housing mo movement, and we want to make sure that we continue to do that. Um, and that's why when we did put together the plan, we put a particular emphasis on making sure that we were going to focus and target a fair amount of our resources on the extremely and very low income. Now, for housing nerds, those are capitalized terms, but in real life, those are many of the people who all of you in this world, in this room, serve. And so we are committing to serve at least 16,000 and probably more than 16,000 very, very low income households over the course of the next 10 years. That's four times as many low and extremely low income individuals as the prior 12 year plan. So we are very serious about making a dent in this serious problem. Um, and we know that for the very low income and extremely low income, supportive housing is really the right answer for many of those people. You all know better than I do the benefits of supportive housing, not just for the human beings, but also as a government official, the long-term benefits for us. Um, it not only provides people the right and the ability to live independently, but ultimately it's going to save taxpayer dollars. Um, I think the numbers right now, and I'm sure Kristen knows this better than I do, it's about $10,000 a year we save um, for every person who we put into supportive housing because of all the ancillary expenses related to shelters, emergency rooms, 
homes, jails, et cetera. So we need to make this population a priority, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. So you also know that about 50,000 families or people and families are living in the city shelter system today. And that's gonna require a very, very complex set of solutions um, in order to address that problem. And part of that also, I think, will be taking on the challenge of creating supportive housing for families, which has not traditionally been the focus of the work, but there are gonna be a huge subset of those families in homeless shelters right now who need supportive services, not just affordable housing. So the homeless system has become, in some respects, not just a short-term solution for families who are having affordable housing crises, but they're actually becoming almost permanently um, entrenched in the shelter system. And so it is going to require a lot of new thinking about how to get those families out of shelter and into either supportive or affordable housing. And we're going to rely on all of you here today to do some really smart thinking about to help us with that challenge. Um, you know, as Ted mentioned, we have seen unbelievable success with prior um, supportive housing agreements with our partners at the state. Um, he mentioned that the New York, New York 3 agreement is almost done. I think the number is about two-thirds of the units have been completed, and we hope to have 9,000 in total um, complete by the end of that agreement in 2015. Clearly, we're very focused on making sure that we work clear, you know, with the state to do that, um, to serve a broader range of people, and I think we're making terrific progress towards that goal. Um, so we are determined to work not just with our partners across agencies in city government, which of course is critical to making sure the solutions are implementable, if that's a word, but really also making sure that we're working with our state and federal partners and that we all continue to do the political work necessary, quite frankly, to make sure that the state and federal government works with us um, and collaborates with us to get the resources we all need. But there are some things that the city are gonna do, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the plan as it relates to you guys. Um, you may be aware that one of the fundamental focuses of the plan is to think really long and hard about what are the municipal assets that we have that we can contribute to this crisis and also focus on supportive housing. So we're really going to take a hard look at zoning. We're going to think about density in a smart way. We're going to look at all of the myriad building codes and building laws and multiple dwelling law and the housing maintenance code and issues around unit size and all the things who anybody who's been a practitioner in this field have often just felt completely exempt aspirated by because the best intentions often are sort of trapped in the bureaucratic crap that makes it difficult for this kind of work to get done. We recognize that, many of us have lived that, and we are committed to doing something about that. We're also committed to making sure that we really effectively use our underutilized parcels, any vacant land, working very collaboratively with the private sector and with mission-driven institutions to really identify sites where supportive housing, mixed income housing, mixed use housing can be developed. We are going to be operating on all cylinders to get this done. So we want to engage all of you to get this done. We're going to require a lot more um, help than we have in the past. And we're going to make sure that every dollar that we spend is effectively leveraging every dollar that our partners in the private sector and across government work. So we also recognize that building more supportive housing is not the only challenge that we face. We also need to realize what we can do in order to move people on from supportive housing. It's a scarce resource, and there are probably a lot of folks in there who are ready to move on, and we bear some responsibility for making sure that we can do that as well. It's a complex system. The city has numerous agencies involved. It has numerous nonprofit partners. And it can be confusing. It can be overlapping jurisdictions. There can be multiple documentation requirements to help people move on from supportive housing. But we are absolutely committed to eliminating those hurdles for both the tenants and for the providers so that we can move people effectively who are ready to get out of supportive housing into affordable housing and make that as efficient as possible, freeing up the supportive housing housing stock and creating more capacity in the system. So we also realize that we have to figure out how to create more housing choices and foster more independence amongst those graduates and helping them connect to the services in the community, many of which we're already providing, but we're just not connecting the dots. 
So we're going to create a whole continuity of care for folks coming out of supportive housing, working with HPD, with the Housing Authority, with all of the other agencies to make it easier for supportive housing tenants to move on and for those chronically homeless households and others who need to go into supportive housing to have those units available. Again, as I said, we don't have the perfect solutions. I think we know what a lot of the problems are and where we can be most effective. But we need you to give us best practices. We need you to tell us what's working in your projects, in your communities, and how we can integrate those into our plans moving forward. We have an amazing set of staff here today. I think they're going to be working with you on various panels. We want this to be an iterative dialogue. But let us be very clear that the mayor is absolutely 100% committed to making sure that supportive housing is front and center of our affordable housing agenda and that we are going to work across government agencies, layers of government, and with all of you to help really make a dent in this problem. So I want to thank you for all the work you've done to date. I'm just sitting here amazed by the number of people. Bill, this is unbelievable. Ted, this is amazing how many people are here to really row in the same direction. So thank you for all of you've done to date and thank you for all the work you're going to do in the future.